Hey friends, uh, welcome back to another video. We're here with the legend himself, Chris Kiefer. Uh, he's a medical doctor who is a rising and prominent nuclear activist, nuclear advocate, and is making some huge impacts uh, in, in the industry at large. So Chris, it's been a while. I think we did this before, but I think officially this is the first time you're going to be featured on my podcast. Welcome. Hey, man. It's, it's great to be here. And I'm a big fan of your work as well. Um, you've got a lot more of the vlogging vibes, which I love. And we did do a great tour of the McMaster Research Reactor together. And we did a high five on top of the gantry. And you know, we got- I think I had to jump for that one. But anyway, it did have to jump. And it sort of shook the gantry upon which the fuel elements are suspended. And I remember the guys being like, uh, please don't do that again because you're going to scram our reactor. Yeah. Uh, so we've had some awesome times together. I think you're a great dude. So I'm looking forward to this. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, same, same same goes here. Big fan um, of all that you do. So man, start from the beginning. I think the story needs to be retold. Um, you're a medical doctor. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I first heard of you um, a couple of years ago during COVID. And mm -hmm. it was, I think it was a CBC radio news channels talking about Pickering Reefer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, who is this doctor? Right. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, doctors are usually, you know, doing their usually own anti-nuclear. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's like the history of it. You know, Helen Caldicott most famously, um, there's some well-meaning physicians out there in the era of atmospheric weapons testing. Right. Um, which was scaring the crap out of people. Um, I mean, this, the world had gone crazy, right? If you think about the number of nuclear bombs in the world, like in the 80s, like tens of thousands between the Soviet Union, each in the Soviet Union and America. And physicians, you know, we take care of patients in our respective clinical environments, but we're also trained in something called upstream medicine. So mm -hmm. social determinants of health. What makes people sick in the first place? Yeah, it's microbes. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, mutations in DNA that cause cancer. But there's a lot of things that impact those. Um and so we're trained to think that way. And these well-meaning physicians were um, trying to shut down the insanity of nuclear weapons testing. They succeeded. Yeah. There was a really interesting study. It was on milk teeth of, of toddlers, and they were finding strontium in them, yeah. right? And, you know, trace some elements, uh, sorry, trace amounts of these elements and nothing that was significant in terms of causing, you know, physiologic harm. But that's a powerful thing. I mean, that's why, you know, when we go through uh, the power plant, that lead box that we have to put in for contamination, that's from lead mined before the atomic weapons testing, because this yeah. stuff went everywhere. It's an insignificant amount. But anyway, essentially, physicians played a massive role in the ban on atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. And then, you know, their ambitions were to eliminate nuclear weapons from the world. That's a geopolitical question. That's mm -hmm. never going to happen, or it's very unlikely to happen, um, just in terms of game theory. Um, but they turned their attention in a misguided way um, towards other aspects of the technology, the peaceful aspects, um, to the point that a lot of these people are against medical isotopes. Oh, wow. wow. I mean, they're against it in the sense they think like cyclotrons can do it all, which ain't the case. You know, I know. The Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council knows. But yeah, anyway, so that's the kind of legacy of physician activism. And folks like Helen Caldicott, I mean, she's received at least 20 honorary doctorates. When I was in uh, my undergrad at Guelph, she got an honorary doctorate there, gave the speech where she said that nuclear plants release more carbon than, I'm not sure if it was a coal plant, but definitely a gas plant because of all, you know, there's so much cement that's poured. There's so much steel involved. And so this was my framing, right? Like I came from kind of the political left. Yeah. Um, and you know, the package of ideas and beliefs, the unexamined beliefs that come along with a political identity, sometimes a cultural identity, whatever else, um, that's something we go through life often not taking the time to examine. And so you asked me about like how I got into this and I've given you like a 10 minute answer that's, you know, weave through all the stuff. Fundamentally, I had a child five years ago, started thinking seriously about climate change, became a big doomer, um, not fun at parties. My ex said, you know, do something about it. She meant sort the recycling, take out the compost, you know, eat organic. And I started looking at, you know, what's going on in my province? Yeah. It's like, what? we're 60% nuclear power. We have one of the cleanest grids in the world. What is going on here? No one knows this. Helen Caldicott was, was FOS. Um, I need to do something about this. And I've always yeah. been like a champion of the underdog. Like my activism prior to nuclear was humanitarian. I've done overseas humanitarian missions. Uh, I fought for refugee rights. Um, I opened one of Canada's first uh, seasonal agriculture worker clinics. I speak Spanish, so serving Mexican and Jamaican migrant worker clinics uh, down in Leamington. Um, I never thought I would be a champion of an underdog technology. That's weird, but here I am five years later, 
decouple podcast, 250 episodes, just deep diving this long form journalism and Canadians for nuclear energy activism at COP. Um, a lot of discussions with decision makers and some good results like the refurbishment of Pickering. Yeah, I think what I really find remarkable about your approach is the ability to make those relationships, right? Like we were at the CNA conference, Canadian Nuclear Association. Um, how has your experience been at this year's CNA? It's been, yeah, it's been great. I mean, I was talking to the French ambassador uh, actually earlier. And so, I mean, that's an example of what happens here at CNA is you can stumble into CEOs, into, uh, you know, I also met the Greek ambassador. I also met the Armenian ambassador. And it's just, we're a small enough community. This is, you know, the venue's too small, right? There's 200 people on the waiting list that couldn't get in. Uh, but the luxury of that, and because, of, I don't know, friendly Canadian culture, we just walk around and talk to each other. Um, and that was something actually the French was saying was like, if, you know, at our industry events, minister, ministers, particularly, um, like we had, we had the blessing of, uh, Todd Smith's presence and the new Brunswick mm -hmm. minister of energy, they're surrounded by an entourage, almost of, you know, bodyguard staffers and they, you know, they don't talk to each and everybody. Yeah. And so that's something that's really unique, uh, about this, uh, conference. It's, you know, this is a representative conference. You see all of the major players, um, you can have fascinating conversations and I personally, been able to pull on a lot of strands and just have a much deeper understanding it just it just keeps deepening because i'm curious and fascinated by this very strange world that y'all live in <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome that's great like um uh yeah tell, tell me a little about a little bit about decouple right i i love your podcast uh i've been following for, for years now right and it's always you know i you know i always I'll go on my spotify and check it out i'm like okay what it's chris talking about next right yeah. Uh, tell me about the origins of decouple. Like, where does that word come from, sure. and what's your what's your vision for uh, for decouple? So, um, I used to do college radio in university, and I, I just discovered this incredible phenomenon, which is you can read a book. You know, maybe it's a book about your hero, right? In my case, it was an American doctor who did refugee work and was in El Salvador during the Civil War, and uh, you know, I, I was like, read his book. And then I tracked him down, gave him a call. I was like, can we talk? I've got a radio show. And the dude talked to me. Right. And I found that over and over again. And then when COVID lockdown happened and we were all, you know, in our homes being lonely, I was like, I'm lonely. I'd like to talk to some cool people. And so I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to start this podcast. I'd been, you know, reading for the, you know, when my son was in a stroller, it's funny, like when you're a new parent, in a sense, you have no time. In another sense, you got lots of time, yeah. you know, so I'd be out reading uh, on my phone, you know, books, pushing the stroller. And I'd been thinking a lot and just felt this like urgent need to, to share some thoughts, to communicate. Um, so decouple <clears throat> just started, you know, it's just me. We've grown. We now have a team. Um, so we've got, you know, I think really good production values. Um, we've got some great short videos in addition to the long form podcast. What I will say is unique um, and what, you know, bizarrely, I kind of feel like when I come to these things um, or the nuclear advocacy community in general is kind of like a Comic-Con phenomenon. Like there's not a ton of nuclear advocates and we all get together, say yeah. a cop. And it's just like we feel this intense fraternity because we're a bunch of weirdos. Um, but yeah, what decouple does i think it really serves the the advocacy community also the industry and the reason is that i managed to find people with incredible expertise who have total editorial freedom well mm. as total as you can get and so we have spicy conversations we talk about controversial stuff and it's a platform to do that because i think the industry really suffers from a communications culture which is very top down very party line wow. this is what we say you know like and with with the pickering okay. battle i mean it was, you know, it was a done deal. It was a decision that had been made. And, you know, I would not have been able to say the things I did or speak openly or lobby or get out of the media if my boss was in the industry. I just, I, I must, you know, <laughs> you're just kind of squirming a little uncomfortably, but that I don't have to squirm uncomfortably in these moments. Um, and I think that's what's led to uh, the effectiveness of our organization and why people listen to the podcast. Because I think there are people out there that go like, I agree with that, but I could never say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you have it. I think that's, no, that's, that's part great. of the I, I personally love that transparency. No. And, I, and I love how there is this new, you know, almost like a league of legends, right? Kind of mm. these these advocates for from nuclear and each one has their own unique flavor right and I, so you know for example myself i'm more industry relevant right and i'm more industry niche and a little bit of a deeper dive but i like i like how you approach nuclear topics from a relevant level where the general public can come jump on and be like okay this is crazy interesting right yeah. and i think it's a little bit of a wormhole right it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. they deep dive into your content and even above you mm -hmm. is isotope Right? right, which is like, 
TikTok cool, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like this is kind of like a wormhole. It starts at the top. Right, right, and it sucks it, a few people down. It just sucks everyone down. Right? Not everyone. Not, and this, this is this is where you're a nuclear engineer and you have a misperception of the general public. The general public, I don't think, listens to my podcast. It's you know, there's some financial Twitter people. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of like energy nerds. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, people that work in all the different energy sectors. And you know, I'd say the content is very nuclear leaning, at least seventy five percent. But you know, we've also had episodes on the romantic origins of the environmental movement. I don't mean you know lipstick and stuff like the the philosophical traditions that underpin this you know new ideology um understanding and examining that because one thing i found that's been effective in my advocacy is having compassion and empathy for those that disagree with with me and my positions mm -hmm. understanding you know the cold war trauma that my parents generation went through and why they could conflate nuclear energy with nuclear weapons it's a very natural conflation um and so yeah, I think I think that's that's a, a power of of the podcast. Um, I you know I have bought a few people that I disagree with on. You know, it's not a great format for that because you can't debate while you're the host. You got to be a good host. Welcome to my house. I'm not gonna you know, I'm not gonna yell at you or not even yell, but I'm not gonna you know have that. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm rambling. It's uh, it's a ton of fun, and uh, I'm you know coming to an event like this and feeling like a micro celebrity. Um, it's it's nice because you speak out you know in your little little podcast studio as you know um and you is anyone listening out there and yeah a lot of people are what's up with the nuclear mustaches <laughs> oh my god oh my god so there's a there's a funny thing where um there's there's a trend in the industry where if you're a nuclear advocate you got to have a mustache mark yeah. nelson chris Kiefer, uh eric meyer eric, eric meyer I mean, and you know, Chris Popoff, uh, he he grew on as people will grow them for the podcast, which is really really cute. <laughs> and and it's this, it's you know, I worry that it's a little too broish, but at the same time, it's totally become a part of the brand. And I think particularly Mark Nelson and I, people confuse us all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah not related. And uh, you know, when we're on the split screen, uh, people are like, yeah, <laughs> they think we're twins. Anyway, I know it's a funny joke, and uh, it, this is a COVID mustache, but. Um, it's it's staying on for life, I think. And you know, you have a great mustache, but uh, you're hiding it right now <laughs> behind that beard. So you know, one day I hope you'll join us. One day, one day. I think that's a neat Invitation. idea. And so, like, what's what's next for the couple, right? Like, I I I enjoy the podcast, but I also enjoy some of your site visits, right? Mm -hmm. Like you did one to, with Bruce Power. Yeah very high quality like documentary filmmaker style with you know J jesse freeston mm -hmm. uh supporting you there uh what's uh what's your future look like for content creation yeah so definitely you know the long form podcast is the heart of of the the vehicle here of decouple um we're definitely you know we have these hour-long deep dives and you know uh, uh, as you know like an interview there'll be these moments that are just golden and then there'll be sometimes an answer that runs on a, a little too long or i'm famous for asking questions excuse me that a little tangential. Um, so we're, we're looking at really like clipping a lot of stuff to make yeah. it more accessible to pull more people in. Um, in terms of the longer form stuff, we're releasing any day now. Uh, the video uh, that we did at, at the Baraka station oh, okay. uh, in the UAE, we got some red carpet access um, to the plant. Um, and uh, that's a fun one. Um, yeah, and I think we'll continue to make uh, more of that sort of documentary content. My initial vision for Decouple was like a full service media organization and, you know, having, again, as you were kind of saying, the gateway drug of like TikTok videos and then short form, you know, YouTube videos that then lead into, um, you know, the longer form pod podcast and just kind of bring people in that way. Um, but, you know, I'm also still a practicing physician and being an editor is a lot of responsibility. Especially when people are making stuff and if you're not up to date on saying, okay, I like that, I don't like that. And the finished product comes in and you say, oh, could you change that? Like, it's not how you make friends. Um, so I've had to, I've had to sort of dial back just in terms of my commitments and time as a father, as a, as a doctor, as a, you know, fiance. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm settling in on the podcast. Um, and you know, it's weird because fundamentally, you know, there was a, a, a podcaster, I didn't really listen to his stuff, but he had a podcast called like my, I think he still has it, my climate journey. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about it is it's like this guy on a, you know, on a quest. And I kind of feel that way. And really, um, you know, sometimes I don't, I don't chase the numbers. It's, it's selfish because I'm just following my curiosities wherever they'll take me. Um, and for whatever reason, I find, again, as an outsider, as an anthropologist of the nuclear sector and community, it is endless. For whatever reason, it's just endlessly fascinating. It's, it's making my dopamine receptors uh, buzz. So. I want to get uh, deeper into this, like as a content creator, even myself, I think 
one thing that is um, a struggle is like burnout, right? Mm-hmm. And also like keeping up the momentum with this content because it's 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 a lot of work, mm-hmm. it's a lot of effort, it's mm-hmm. a lot of strategy and um, and thinking behind things that are published. And so um, I really admire you because you you have a family, right? Mm-hmm. You have you have a child, you know, you have a relationship, and so how do you balance those things? Um, I mean, I have uh, the most wonderful fiance in the world. She's uh, very supportive. Um, couldn't do it without her. Um, yeah, it's it's a struggle sometimes. I'm away from my son right now, and that does really bother me. Um, you know, there's this thing of uh, I, I used to do a lot of palliative care, and you uh, you meet with people who are dying, and you're by their deathbed, and you're providing you know comfort care and things like that. But you're also you know you're talking to the people, and it's it's one of the most intimate. Medicine is always intimate, but it's you know when someone's dying, it's very intimate, and you have discussions on you know deathbed discussions like what would you do live differently about your life? Yeah. And like universally it comes back to, I should have spent more time with my family. Should have like cultivated those close relationships. My ego got caught up in this work or this job title. I was too career focused, you know, um, because fundamentally we're social animals. And, mm. and when it comes down to the bare bones of life and death, that's what matters, your family. Um, and so sometimes I question that, you know, um, definitely it's, it's uh, rewarding doing this work, um, feeling like I'm making good things happening. When we won the Pickering refurbishment battle, um, I really had a sense that on my deathbed, I'm still going to be like, hell yeah. Because thinking about the, you know, three or 4,000 people that work directly at the plant and the, you know, 3,600 full-time equivalent jobs tied into it, um, that feels really meaningful that those people continue to have, you know, and this, the, the story of nuclear is the human beings in it. There's fancy technology, there's chain, you know, there's razor wire on the fences. Um, there's these, you know, humongous, you know, hulking concrete buildings. Healthcare is, is kind of similar. It's high tech. There's, it's backed by pharmaceutical industry, medical device manufacturing industry, you know, high risk, complex, but there's a human face to it. The doctors yeah. and nurses who look after you. Nuclear, the public doesn't see in, but you know, it's a super inspiring story of human flourishing, going up to Bruce County, an area that used to be very economically depressed and seeing it's thriving and just seeing the level of education that people are getting, either, you know, getting that outside of the job, um, obviously continuing to really develop it. It's just a place where it's just, you know, striving for continued excellence. Uh, and there's something in it for everybody. So that's bizarrely, again, one of the, one of the motivators and something that, you know, keeps me from, uh, you know, feeling the burnout too badly. That's great. That's great. that's a message that really resonates with me as well, right? Because um, it's the impact that you're making, and it's in a way we're a bit of pioneers in this uh, this age of social media. We're the first to really uh, showcase to the public. Listen, this is th- these are the people behind these reactors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That role is really special. It's um, and, and and so yeah, I guess with with that responsibility of having families, it's. Um, explaining that right that hey listen we're we're sacrificing our time to make that impact Mm -hmm. there's this i had this great idea for a reality tv show and it exists in another format i forget what it's called but i'll describe it maybe some people will recognize it um i had this idea of take an anti-nuclear activist and put them in the household of a new like put them in a nuclear family and have them live (laughs) there for a week okay because because i mean this debate is getting less and less polarizing i think 10 15 years ago um it was it was vicious right um but you know even with that they would experience you know these everyday human beings that i think are doing really heroic work in terms of fighting climate change keeping the air clean making medical isotopes um and just again just seeing each other as human beings and also it'd be cool for you know a nuclear person to go and live in an anti-nuclear household i think we need more of that um as I've matured, I would say one of the biggest things nuclear has taught me, um, you know, I come from the political left and generally speaking, I think the political left has a very um, poor understanding of energy and nuclear. There's, it's not so much an engineering discipline anymore. It's the left has kind of left the factory floor and gone to university um, humanities, which is fine. Um, but, you know, as someone who was, who was on the political left, um, I used to not listen to anything on the political right. But, you know, on the political right, there tends to be more people who run companies, who understand the built world, who are engineers. And they might understand energy really well. I'm going to listen to them. Um, and so I've, I've just got this, you know, much bigger tolerance. And I think there is a need for anti-nuclear activists. I, I don't think they should, you know, obviously they've dominated this course in Germany and they've helped Germany commit industrial suicide. Um, that was too much, but we need a little bit of everybody on the spectrum. It needs to be balanced so that as a society, we make the right decisions and we get all of the input. There's like the more diversity of opinion, the better. 
um, ultimately to help us make decisions. And that would be like my call out to the nuclear industry is open up that conversation. Don't yeah. be so restrictive because democracy triumphs over autocracy and the communications culture in nuclear. I'm, you know, I'm probably going to piss a few people off is autocratic. And I think we need to unleash people like communicators to spread the good word, be human, right? <laughs> Show that human face with the public, but also like internally, um, I think we need to have a lot more conversations, red teaming. You know, I love that concept. Like if someone's a, about to commit to a decision, get a, get a group of like five people together, you know, almost like a debating society to tell you why it's the wrong move. You might still make that move. Mm -hmm. um so i'd like to i'd like to see more of that um you know again as this outside anthropologist is putting my nose in other people's business yeah definitely i i i, I think there's uh uh there's a platform and there's there's a way to create synergies between industry between activists between advocates mm -hmm. right and i love seeing people like you from outside of the industry come in and uh and actually be a voice for us because it's you know, for, for example, myself, right? I work for the industry, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not representing the industry on this channel, technically, right? <laughs> my opinions stated here. My opinions. Reflect my yeah, 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 yeah. So, but it's great to see someone that he's not getting a paycheck uh, from, from the industry. That's not his bread or butter, right? No. But the fact that uh, you're coming in uh, from a third-party perspective as a doctor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. From a completely different discipline. It goes to show a lot, right? Even um, when I go to look at Australia, Australia Australians for Nuclear, uh, William Shekel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he's uh, impressed me a lot. Yeah. Uh, rising activist in nuclear, I'm I'm mind blown, right? Like you, yeah. you guys are really um, uh, appreciated uh, by those that are still in the industry, like myself. So I hope you know that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I always call him like William Shatner by accident, but <laughs> that, that kid is unreal. His energy, you just getting impromptu uh, interviews with French president yeah. at COP. Big <laughs> shout outs there. Was real. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, sometimes it, there is some frustration um, with the industry. Um, but yeah, we don't take any support from the industry, which is you know what gives us an, an independent editorial line. And I always say I'm an anti shill because I sacrifice a lot of time, but I also sacrifice a lot of income. Uh, because yeah. I could, you know, and maybe, maybe I should be working a few more emerge shifts. Like I work a little less so that I can do all this stuff. I justify that going back to the beginning of this interview, um, with this idea of upstream medicine, you know, I, I started practice when Ontario still relied on coal for 25, 20% of its electricity. I saw, you know, the repercussions of that in terms of asthma, emphysema. Um, and we know now that you know, that particular, uh, uh, pollution also causes vascular disease, heart attacks, strokes. We know it leads to cancers. Um, and you know, anecdotally I've seen way less asthma, you know, and, and like I had a, a friend who was growing up and they wouldn't leave their house in the summer cause they'd yeah. have asthma attacks. Like we had 54 smog days a year and the story of nuclear in Ontario, people talk about the coal phase out. It began in 1973. Right. Or when did, when did Pickering A come on online? 71 or 73? 71, yeah. Seven, it began in 1971 because we didn't have oil. We didn't have, uh, was, we don't have oil, gas. We did have a bit of oil. Anyway, we didn't have coal or, or gas. Um, and we were importing it and it was expensive. You know, back then before climate change got bad, the lakes froze. We couldn't get that coal across them. They're pretty rowdy unions in the States mining coal. And, you know, we had all kinds of supply disruptions. Um, and just like France, you know, said we do not have oil, but we have ideas. We didn't have coal, but we had ideas. Um, and so there's this really unique story in Ontario that I think needs to be told. If we had not gone nuclear, Pickering, Darlington, and Bruce would almost certainly be coal stations. Yeah. Right. And we would not be off coal. Kicking the coal habit would be very hard and we'd be doing it with gas if we were doing it at all. And that is an incredible story. Like we built North America's largest coal station in Anticoke and Ontario Hydro, they went bigger, they went home, you know, four unit, eight unit plants. Yeah. Um, that's astounding. Imagine a coal station like Nanticoke in Oshawa, uh, sorry, in uh, Pickering. And there's a reason there's a nuclear plant in Pickering. It's because there's, uh, you know, auto sector was massive in Ontario and Oshawa is right there. Yeah. So big, big, uh, you know, load uh, demand center. So just, just to add that story, like the can-do reactors technology itself was made as a, uh, to be financially feasible as in compared to, compared to coal, yeah. coal power production. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah. you know, creating an asset, which, um, which w it's, producing clean electricity, creating new jobs and, mm -hmm. and having that transition plan for coal workers to go work in nuclear. That's, that's another element of the story, which, uh, kind of amazes me. Right. And so 
you know, I've, I looked at some statistics, like, you know, they share statistics all the time, like um, uh, about new Ontario's energy grid mm -hmm. and like it compared to other nations uh, in Europe or across the world, it's one of the cleanest grids in the world, yeah. right? And so, yeah, I agree. Like this story needs to be shared and reshared, mm -hmm. right? Just to drive home that message. And so, um, Chris, I think this was a great chat. Yeah. I loved having this conversation with you. Um, uh, is there any last uh, thoughts and words that you'd like to share with me? Yeah, I mean, just uh, I, I think, you know, this is probably going to be watched a lot by industry folks. Um, there's something, there's a story here and, and a Canadian story, which is uh, amazing in terms of, you know, there are basically three reactor technologies which have stood the test of time. Yeah. You know, the RBMK, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> the, uh, you know, gas graphite reactor, the French went, you know, with, a, with a PWR and the, the British went a little longer, but they're back to PWR. So you have PWRs, BWRs and HPWRs. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's a phenomenal story. Uh, I think we have 31 reactors, and I don't think that's counting the, the 14 can-do clones in, uh, in uh, India, um, from this tiny country, from a little crown corporation going up against you know, some large multinational corporations, much bigger countries. Um, that is a phenomenal, um, phenomenal story and something we should be very proud of. Um, and you know, this export story is wild. I mean, nuclear is so geopolitical. And I just learned today, I need to go confirm it, but the Chinchan build in China was the fastest reactor built in, in the Chinese fleet, four years. Damn. Right. So we got something special. I think we should really uh, cherish that. You know, I, things are now getting a little political as we look at tech selection. Um, but I can't help being a little bit of a nationalist on that one. Well, thanks again, Chris, for being on this channel. And uh, it was great, great chatting with you here. CNA. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Yeah.